Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Tech Connect Podcast. I'm John Martin. And I'm Dean Riverman. So, Dean, the U.S., uh, we tend to do some things differently from we the do. rest of the world, right? Yeah, a little bit. We, we yeah. drive on a different side of the road. We do, Really? We tend to have... I drive on the right side of the road. Meaning oh, the... Cur- what? No. There, yeah, there, are, there are folks that will dispute that <laughs> quite heartily. Of Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We, we, we tend to have very uh, large size meal portions. Everything, yes. Everything, Everything yes. yes. But yes. You know, just before going on, you mentioned pickup trucks. Yes. And how massive our, pickup trucks, our trucks yeah. are. We can't even yeah. fit them in our garages. They're so <laughs> massive. Um, that is true, by the way, because I got one of those you know, Ford Expeditions many, many yeah, day, yeah, years ago. Yeah. I had to make sure it fit in my garage yeah, before I actually a, purchased it's, it. It's sad you have to think about that, but it's you sad. do. Yeah. yeah, that's an American thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Like crippling health care debt. That's something we only seem to do very well. So there's, <laughs> there's some good, differences. There's, yeah, yeah, there's, there's some, the whole moon thing. I don't know. There's, where, yeah. <laughs> there's some differences between the U.S. and the rest of the world. 100%. The reason why I mention that is because mm. we're going to talk a little bit about some differences in retail ah, today. Yes, yes. Uh, some trends some that trends. are global, mm-hmm. not just the U.S., trends across, you know, uh, mm-hmm. across the world, mm-hmm. and maybe some things that do differ a little bit from what we expect here. Because I know some of our VARs kind of might play internationally or interested yep. in what's going on internationally. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we've got a couple of our friends from Blue Star yes. in the UK and EMEA joining us today. We have yes. Richard Austin and your Malcorps to talk yes. to us a little bit about some of these trends. Absolutely. They're going to explore the trends that we're looking at here, compare no. them to theirs, where do, where do we differ, where do we intersect. It's like a mastermind uh, that we brought together here. That's right, yes. yeah. A ma- yes. It's not us. I mean, no, no, no. The it's others them. are the masterminds. <laughs> yes, yeah. of course, yes. <laughs> as, as usual here. So, so yeah, we're going to be getting to these trends. We're going to talk about stuff like Omnichannel, we're going to talk about online shopping, mm-hmm. get into payments, all that kind of maybe stuff. Maybe some and of just, the tech? Maybe some, well, of course we're going to get into the tech. I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. This I, is, hey, it's the Tech Connect podcast. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we got to put tech. tech in the title for a reason. <laughs> uh, all that plus our usual value to the VAR. What's Tech Connecting with us? It's time to plug in and get connected. Welcome to the Tech Connect podcast. It's time to get connected. <laughs> All right, as I mentioned, we've got two fantastic guests on with us today who I think both actually asked to be on the pod, wanted to be on the pod. I don't know. You know, I mean, you, I, well, yeah, I, we I was didn't actually have to go out and recently. drag them into it. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. I was impressed at their retail knowledge. Yeah. You know, they've been on the podcast that we have over in Europe right. as well. So, no, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, so good. So why not? Like I said, the mastermind is here talking about go. retail. All right, retail. well, first up, we've got Richard Austin. He is a Blue Star BDM for UK and Ireland. Richard, welcome to the show. Glad to have you. Tell us a little bit about yourself your time at Blue Star. And I got a little pop quiz question for you. What is something that you have noticed about Americans doing very differently from, you know, where you are or just the rest of the world in general? Okay, well, uh, thanks for having me on the show. Um, I, I only agreed to this because I thought it involved a trip to Kentucky, but uh, it turns out I actually get to do the podcast from my own office at home. So, uh, but it's still a pleasure to be here. I'm a big fan of the podcast and um, regular regular listener myself and uh, definitely really, really pleased to be here. I'm, um, I'll, I'll stop fanboying in a second. And uh, But this, this for me, appearing on the podcast, it's a bit like getting asked to play guitar with the Bruce Springsteen and the East Street Band. So I'm, uh, Wow. I'm, hey, all right. that's high praise. <laughs> it is. Super excited to to be here. Um, I've been with um, Blue Star in Europe for um, just about two years this month. Um, uh, reasonably long history in the uh, point of sale retail and hospitality industry, where I, I think I started working originally in about the mid 15th century, it seems like uh, at the moment. Uh, so um, dot very much specialized back then, right? Yeah. Yeah, dot matrix. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Iron Age dot matrix printers, that's right. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, basically, it's my role to help uh, partners in the retail and hospitality space, uh, just just to make it easier for them to to do business with Blue Star. Um, so yeah, in terms of um, differences that I've spotted with the with the US, I think I just go back to what uh, Dean said. Really, I think the, um, the 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 size of the vehicles there is definitely. Uh, I remember my, my first ever trip to the US. We went to the. Uh, we pulled into the office car park and, and I remember asking the guy that I was in the car with, where is the second car park? Where's the car park where you keep the normal size vehicles? <laughs> <laughs> 
It doesn't exist. <laughs> no, uh, it, no, it does not. It no. doesn't exist. Uh, no. Just bigger, better, monstrous. Yeah. 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 Well, you yeah, know, it exactly. is what it is. It, it's it, hard to put put a big V8 into something small. Right? That's true. You know, maybe maybe we can get a little more condensed as we go. Oh, more I electric, think we're getting there. So, I think yeah. we're getting there. Yeah, for sure. All right. Other guest today is Jord Malcorps. He is a Blue Star EMEA BDM. EMEA being uh, Europe, Middle East, and Asia. In case you didn't know that, because every now and then I come across yep. people, I say that, and they go like, "What does that even? What's mean? that even mean?" See, that's uh, an American the response to it. it yeah. That's exactly. There you go. That's that's true. <laughs> Anywhere else, they were like, "Yeah, I know what that means." And Americans like, "What? What?" Uh, <laughs> That's a very good American accent you Thank just you. did there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, your specialty, your specialty is POS and payment. Your welcome to the show. Tell us a little about yourself. And same question for you. What do what do we do differently that uh, has kind of surprised you? Thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting us, of course, to be on this uh, this podcast. Um, for me, my personal, I work uh, for Blue Star now nine years. Uh, basically, my first job. So not as a, as, as experienced that Richard is. Um, I did professional uh, basketball before, so I've studied in the U.S. for for quite some time, and I think that's where I saw main differences between Europe and uh, and, and U.S. One of the things, of course, that's very obvious is the healthcare system. Where you know I'm speaking for the Netherlands, I'm based in the Netherlands, and so for us it's very collective. Um, of course, in the U.S. it's a bit different, and then of course the uh, education. So for us, uh, we get it. You know, 99% sponsored by the government. And for me, of course, as a foreign exchange student to, to do uh, college in the US, it's, it's a bit expensive, right? So uh, after three and a half years, um, yeah, we had a, a pretty large bill uh, from our side, of course, for the US study, but it was all worth it. So very good. So that's the main difference I, I would see in, the, in between Europe and the US. Yeah. There you go. Did yeah. not know the basketball connection. No, that's a good that's one. That's awesome. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We just went yeah. through a little March Madness here in the US. <laughs> yeah. So, indeed. Yeah. yeah. Still, yeah. still, yeah. still going on. Yeah. Still going on. Yeah. Still going on. Yeah. Everyone's brackets got destroyed. They're destroyed. Monumentally. Yeah. So. Yeah. Forget it. Mm-hmm. I guess it's the sweet, sweet eight right now, right? The yeah. Last that's right. Eight, right? That's right. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, then, hey, let's get into this conversation. We wanted to talk a little bit about retail trends for for this year and beyond. Yep. And again, I mean, you know, kind of wanted to expand them a little bit out to not yeah. just here, but you know, globally, what we're seeing going uh-huh. on. And if if there is some things that are in common, things that are a little different, mm-hmm. maybe things. I know sometimes you guys will experience things on the other side of the pond that you know when it'll happen there and start there and then kind of make its way over mm-hmm. to the U.S. You know, and we vice to be versa. Late adopters sometimes, uh-huh. yeah, and vice versa. Yep, so sure. so maybe we'll pick up on some of those too. Yeah. Um, this kind of was inspired a little bit by an article that uh, Lightspeed actually put out about yes. retail trends. Yeah. Um, so it's a retail really trends article. and predictions 2023, what to expect in the year ahead. I'll drop the link in the show notes like mm-hmm. always. So uh, you can check it out if you want to read it through it on your own. There's like uh, 10 good points they get through. We're going to just, we're going to dig into just a few of those to kind of, uh, you know, level set on, on where we think some of these trends might be going to make some of our own predictions. So, mm-hmm. but before we do dig into that though, I, I kind of want to start with, you know, just talking about maybe some differences on the retail side between, the U.S. and Europe. So, is there anything on in retail that would surprise us that you know is different than the way we do things here in America? Sure, I can probably uh, highlight one. Um, first of all, I think it's very good. You know, I, I, I saw your podcast before on the global care. Um, I think you know Lightspeed is one of the examples. I think as an ISV that's you know been treated in the global care program as we do business with them in America, but also in Europe. Um, and I think one of the big difference in retail today. Um, versus the uh, versus the U.S. is the fiscalization. So of course we have multiple countries with different laws um, uh, that we have to follow. Um, so I would say six, perhaps seven countries in Europe uh, have fiscal laws where we have to apply, of course, by you know the fiscal regulations that the government puts down in that country. Um, so for example, Italy, Greece, uh, Germany, they all have different fiscal laws that have to be implemented in either the POS. Uh, or the printing side of uh, of the hardware, uh, which of course for us um, is a bit of a difference uh, within the U.S. I think in the U.S. there's one um, uh, law basically on, uh, on on fiscalization, um, and in Europe, you know, when we work with 30 different countries, that that's that's the biggest difference I would say. Apologize to the in the back. I guess we're in the distribution center, so no worries. <laughs> I think the I mean that's, that's one of the clear differences that. You know, the U.S. is is one country. Uh, it's the United States, and, and Europe is it's it's lots of different countries, and, and each country is different. So, what's what may be different from between the U.K. and and the U.S. and and, and Germany and and the U.S. Is, could also be different between Germany and the U.K. So the 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 geography is you know it, it's it's probably it's, it certainly would be wrong to try to lump all of the European countries together and, and having the same trends because even there's even differences between. Um, between the different countries here 
And I think one thing that I've certainly noticed in terms of um, some of the differences in, in terms of retail is that there's a lot more space in, in US shops. So you tend to have you know, the big brick block of a cash register where the, the, the cash drawer and the and and the it's and, and all of the rest of the pod systems all linked together sits on top of the counter there's plenty of space to do that whereas i think in in some of the countries here there's, there's a lot less space in general um and, and at the counter in retail so sometimes you've got to get quite innovative in terms of making sure that the you know the pos screen and the cash drawer is all integrated together and some of it has to be hidden away underneath the counter and uh, so that that's that's another another pretty key difference that that i would say exists that you wouldn't necessarily even think of yeah no totally i mean you, you know that's kind of one of those ongoing jokes i guess or or <laughs> right. you know that you know everything in europe is a lot smaller right, right? right. And, and so they just have to deal with that, that that kind of space but what i'd like to to hear your opinion on you know when you think about the the, the shopping behavior uh here that, that we experience in the u.s you know you've got things like amazon which i know you guys have as well been very disruptive in the retail mm-hmm. space in the sense that you know, from a convenience factor, if I, can, if I can just speak, you know, from what our family does, you know, Amazon is used for convenient things, mm-hmm. you know, like, oh, man, I forgot to order this and just order right, it real quick. Right. Whereas the retail experience is now just that it's a retail experience. So we still go out on the weekends and go to the big box that, that uh, um, Austin was just talking about, or Richard was just talking about. But, you know, what is it that about that, that that makes it worth going to? And it's the kind of the shopping experience, I think, that, right. that Americans, you know, we we still like that shopping experience. Is is it the same in Europe? I mean, you know, do you, do people still like to just go shop? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, um, I've seen, read some interesting articles about this just recently, where the the online and in store both remain really really important. And one one thing that I thought really was particularly interesting was that if you are more likely to shop online, if there is a store local to you for that online retailer so for example you might you might buy your actual clothes online but you're more likely to shop with an online retailer where you could take that back to a physical store so that that integration between online and and physical retail is 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 really quite an important one and um i mean obviously that doesn't apply to amazon or it it only applies in rare cases to amazon where they've got maybe a handful of shops i think but uh um there's there's plenty of other examples where yeah i think you know the difficulty of having to ship clothes backwards and forwards until you you find a shirt that actually looks right on you is uh if you can just do that in you know return it to a local store that's 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 pretty pretty useful i think yeah well we for us as well that i expected a little bit in COVID. you know after post COVID, that uh, physical stores would be less than it is today and I think we found out that this, you know, is still mandatory and the customers still very much like to go into stores instead of just online. Um, so that surprised me a little bit that, you know, the, the, the offline is, is much bigger than it than, than I thought it would be after after COVID. So that's, that's for us a good trend, I would say, especially in, uh, in, in hardware. Another area that I would you know, like to get your take on is around because the Lightspeed article touched on it uh, in the uh, what they call the bigger focus on sustainability mm-hmm. and corporate social responsibility, which for me, uh, Europeans always seem to be ahead oh, on, yeah, on that yeah. type of or, you know, their optics are, are different right, there. Right. So does sustainability. So, you know, Richard, as you're talking about, yeah, I mean, I'm with you. You know, you order a shirt. It's delivered to you. you it's not the right size. You deliver it back, back and forth, back and forth. You know, now we're all thinking, well, is that really what's the environmental impact on? something like that as opposed mm-hmm. to me just going to the store so i mean what about sustainability and things of that nature are you starting to see that what my my again my perception is is that in europe that's a little bit more of a uh, a table stake right you, you you have to be sustainable or at least have that play uh in order to be viable is that a truism or or, or is it you know not that different i, I would say it's, it's it's definitely a thing here and, and again it varies across countries I, I i lived in germany about 30 years ago for for a year and um i always remember remarking even in the in the 90s where um germany seemed to be so much far ahead of of the uk even in, in terms of um recycling and, and sustainability and i think i would say that to a good extent the the UK is now caught up to to Germany as it was in the nineties, but yeah, I, I think that's that's I think that's a there's, there's some truth in in that uh, 
in that thought, Dean, yeah. I think uh, the most uh, countries that drive sustainability within Europe is the Nordics countries, so it's Sweden and Denmark and, you know, uh, Norway. Uh, those are very far ahead, I would say, on the other countries in, in Europe. Um, so we basically all look at their standards and we follow their standards. Um, so, yeah, definitely on electric vehicles, for example, they, you know, I think 80% of the Norwegian cars are electric, which is bizarre. Um, so they are very far ahead on, on the rest of the European countries, I would say, in sustainability and putting kind of, you know, the, the bar on where we need to be. Yeah. And so, you know, part of the takeaway for me is no matter where you are in the world, I, I think it has an impact front of house and back of house. Yeah. Right. Yeah. When you think about the logistics happening in, you know, behind the scenes. In fact, I mean, we have we've got an executive summit coming up and we're going to talk about pallet sustainability. Yep. Right. I mean, even getting down to that level. And, and these are really important topics, I think, for a lot of these retailers to to address. Right. You know, it's right. not just the tech that we talk about, but it's also other tech that are influenced, whether it's automation, robotics and, and things of that. That nature to again all the way down to sustainability on a pal level. Yeah, so definitely. you know, you know, yeah. I was gonna, I was gonna kind of piggyback on the thing about the returnable transport yeah, item right. stuff, the mm-hmm. pallets and the plastic totes or whatever they're mm-hmm. trying to to maintain track because we, I've noticed lately we've had you know a lot more connections with software companies and folks that are trying to get in on that particular space. Mm. And I think it's interesting because I know for our a lot of our vars you know that are focused more on SMB, they may not they may look at like the WalMarts or the Krogers or the you know the yeah. the big huge shopping yep. chain. The right. world. Like okay, those are those are massive unicorns that we would love to get a piece of, but we're not likely to get involved. There. Right. We're, we're focused more on you know more the local mom and pop that's type right. stores that's or right. regional type stores for the most part. But mm-hmm. I think that's an area where as these big companies start paying more and more attention to these sustainability initiatives, maybe there is a play for you to get in there if you're getting in early. There could be because that's becoming starting to become a popular mm-hmm. topic. Is mm-hmm. how can we? Uh, you know, how can we manage sustainability within our organization? Mm-hmm. How do we, you know, how do we save some money on, you know, somewhere with that that we're, you know, giving an example of our, you know, the, what is it, EGC or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, this, you know, the, the sustainability stuff or ESG, whatever it is. Right. Like, how, how are we doing that kind of stuff? And there's one little piece that I think if you're, if you're looking for a way into maybe some of the big dogs that might help you do that. Mm. Then I, I think, think going back to, go ahead, Richard. I was going to say, it's, it's um, also interesting to see that some of our vendors are starting to take this really, really seriously as well. Uh, I know Epson's a good example of this in terms of their packaging and their, even down to the manufacturing ethos. And, and I'm, I'm sure that you know they're not the only example among manufacturers that we work with. So it's it's really nice to see that we know it's something that's really, really important to retailers. And it's nice to see that that what we're able to do and we're able to demonstrate straight that through the, the partners that we're working with, we're able to... To actually almost be, you know, have that sustainability built into the DNA of the products that we're um, that, that we're selling, it's uh, it's becoming increasingly important. You know, you, you get a new you get a new customer coming on, and, and more and more, if, especially if it's if it's a bigger reseller, they're they're looking for us to to be able to justify that we're you know we've got sustainability built into our practices, which goes back to the practices that the the vendors are uh, are deploying as well. And also, of course, the recycling part, we see a lot of, you know, recycling mandates with our customers that, you know, if we recycle something or scrap something, we have to recycle it with certificates uh, to also provide back to the customer, right? Um, and I think this is all because of the pressure metals. We all know what's going on, you know, in the Congo and then, you know, other other regions where pressure metals, of course, are, are quite, you know, um, I would say dicked not perfectly in a in a healthy way. I would say, um, so I think that also gives the pressure to a lot of you know our materials like cobalt that we need to recycle that and make sure that it's done in a proper way. Yeah, definitely. Yep. So yep. we brought up earlier this idea about the the in store versus online shopping mm-hmm. and how important it is for retailers to be able to support both sides. Kind of have to. Uh, right? You have to at this right? point. I mean, like again, it's a it's an online shopping world. But, you know, to your point that people still want to shop in store, but they also want to shop online. They want to have the best of those both worlds. Yeah. And you are, to your point, you know, I think that, you know, we're starting to see a, a lot more folks that think, hey, I, I just need my shop. I need my local shop to also have that availability and option for me, too, whether it be for returns or just mm-hmm. because I want to have expanded selection. So, mm-hmm. you know, how, how do retailers juggle that juxtaposition right now, especially if we get down to the SMB side of things, you know, where it's not the the big chains that obviously have the infrastructure to build in an entire online shopping dynamic. That's right. How do we, you know, how, how do we work with those retailers? What's going on with them to figure out how to prioritize which side of the business they're supposed to be focusing on, how to manage the two? What's, what's that dynamic look like for you guys there, you know, and, 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 and honestly, globally right now? 
Yeah, I think from our side in Europe, of course, it's it's mainly the nano and then the micro merchants is probably what we're referring to. Um, so this is below small medium business. I would say small medium business, I think, has the tools in Europe to to implement this only channel uh, strategic. Uh, for the nano merchants and the micro merchants, it gets a little bit more tough, right? Because they're a single store, for example, a mom's and pop store on the corner that sells, you know, um, 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 you know, certain stuff. But it's it's a very small um, organization, and I think you know with these all these ISVs that you know facilitate these on the channel services uh, have plugins and different features uh, at one ISV. I think that really changes the game for you know nano merchants and micro merchants to play at the same level that you know the larger corporations do. Um, so for us, these ISVs really bring, you know, a different strategy, I would say, into nano and micro merchants to, you know, have a plain, uh, of a, of a, a plain level uh, a field to, uh, to, to compete against the larger chains. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think, I think the technology is becoming certainly more and more open to, uh, uh, to different um, companies. I mean, one thing that brought it home to me is an example from hospitality rather than from resale, uh, from, from retail, but uh, the, um, one of the, one of the, a good example of a, of a nano merchant in 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 the uk would be a fish and chip shop right so uh um and fish and chip chip shops can get really really busy so but there's the solutions available from some of our partners to be able to put a, a, a kiosk an ordering kiosk or even a couple of ordering kiosks into a fish and chip shop to just manage that queue better at busy times and i think that that that's just a it's just a a different way you you know we've been able to see that in places like mcdonald's for for quite a few years but it's really really good to see that same technology being deployed in in the humble british chippy i think it's uh you know it's, it's really uh really good to see that you you can you know that you've got that same convenience in in your your local shop as, as you would as you'd expect to have in a, in a massive multinational uh, burger chain yeah you know if this one's a really interesting question for me because you know from a tech standpoint you know i get it and, and i think your had it kind of hit the nail on the head in the sense that the, it's the smb world really the small would you call it micro retailer i guess you know i worry about them mm-hmm. in competing mm-hmm. against the the experience that the larger uh, entities can provide right, right? because right. because they have the resources and things of that nature but you know i'm hoping that the isv community out there will embrace the fact that there needs to be you know there needs to be a holistic solution to enable these right. small or micro retailers to be able to do the things like taking online returns and stuff like that but that takes an ecosystem right yep. it takes an ecosystem of delivery vehicles that can do that you know as opposed to an amazon who has their own fleet right, uh, right. type of a thing uh, so you know there there's hope but it's going to take to me, it's going to take an ecosystem. So, what would you do if you were a retailer? What you know? How do you spend your your resources? Where do you spend your resources? I, and I think Richard was going down a good path. You know, maybe you could spend you know time on the tech in the store because to me, again, it gets back to the experience and wanting to level up that. If I owned a retail establishment, I would have an eye on frictionless in the retail experience in my location. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. I'm going to be looking at tech, tech like self checkout kiosk. To Richard's point. I mean, I think that that can add a lot uh, to the overall experience right, when somebody right. walks in. Oh, you know, you just want to make that as frustration less as possible, right? right. And so invest in the tech that's going to do that. Maybe the endless aisle comes through, you know, un- online, and that's easy to integrate. But, you know, when you start getting into some of the logistical things, oh, man, it feels a little gummy, right? right? right. Like, how do we, how do we do that, enable yeah. that? But, uh, but again, I'm worried more about the micro. What do you guys think there? I mean, are you... Well, yeah, George. Yeah, I think on the micro and nano merchants, the you know probably four years ago when the fee-based payment companies stood up. So this is the Zettles, the Shopify's of the world. Uh, they came basically along with fee-based payments, and anytime you make a transaction, you pay for that transaction a certain fee. However, included with that transaction, you get a software license for free. So basically, the POS is for free, but also online, right? They base it online as well for free. Um, and I think this is something where the nano merchants and the micro merchants really came into play, right? They don't have to pay an, 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 a starting fee, for example, to get this up and running. They only pay when they make a sale. And of course, that's very promising in their ears uh, that they don't have to put any investment up front. And I think they really leveled uh, the playing field uh, about three to four years ago when, when all these fee-based payment companies came in. Uh, and we have a few in Europe, to be honest. Yeah. But, you know, the, the bad part there is that it's elbowing out some of what I would call the traditional POS software that, that's been in there and, and maybe doesn't have the resources to, to flex like that, right. you know, for right. lack of a better right. term. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. 
And I think that's that, that's a very good example. Um, one of my friends has a store, um, and they were based, for example, on the Zettel software because it was free and it was only uh, fee-based payments. Uh, but they grew to a different scale. So after 50 employees and a certain revenue per month, they jumped and they went, for example, to Lightspeed software, right? Because it's a little bit more expensive from that point, but at least, right, they could have that starting phase up. So it's basically almost a financial model for these fee-based payments to get these nano merchants up and running, which I think is it was very helpful in our uh, in our industry in Europe. Yeah, for sure. Just going back to what you were saying a second ago, uh, uh, Dean, as well. I think one of the one of the, the this growth in self-service and self-checkout, the thing that's driving that to a good extent is is staff shortages. This this a uh, I think what it from what I've heard from the US as well, that's that's a, a problem not exclusive to, to the UK or to Europe is is actually whether you're a big or a small retailer or hospitality outlet, you're, you're finding the right staff um, or finding staff at all is the uh, is, is is becoming a challenge. And that's that's where we're seeing a huge drive towards the self-service uh, technologies as well. Um, so just just to pick up on no, that. No, oh, oh, so that's good to hear, I guess, in a mm, bad yeah. way. <laughs> We're not the only ones experiencing the labor shortage, but yeah, that's a huge driver right now, you know, yep. front of house uh, of, of adopting the technology because if you can't, you're right, if you can't find the people to, to work, um, then we need to we need to implement some type of a yeah, technological yeah. answer yeah, you know, to that along the way. Well, so. I, I like also that we're not talking about this from a perspective of like, hey, every single retailer out there has to figure out how to create an online shop. Mm. You've got to build a full online shop, have a full online retail, have a full web presence kind of thing. I mean, sure, great. If you can do it, fine. Mm -hmm. But let's be honest, there are going to be some, especially when you get into the, you know, the nano and the micro emergence or whatever, that just don't have that capacity or ability to do that. Mm -hmm. Don't even have maybe enough products or inventory diversity that even makes sense mm -hmm. but then getting back to richard's point like if you're if you're just focusing maybe on some hey some self-service options some ways to alleviate traffic when folks are in store maybe a little bit of technology and, and and digitalization that helps make the experience when they're in their shopping faster and easier and simpler mm -hmm. like i think that's the places where you can introduce some technology that's still kind of helping you bridge that gap and creating the the kind of new retail mentality of you know that it's not just a a static store pick up something, walk to the cash register, buy it kind of, you know, purchase, but also doesn't have to get all the way up to, yeah, we've built out an entire giant ecosystem online that's, you know, uh, you know, a full, full online platform, a full <laughs> shop or whatever. I mean, you don't, you don't have to go all the way to get on board with some of the new trends and mm -hmm. to get on board with what's happening when people are walking into your store and have a phone in hand and expect to yeah, somehow be right. able to do something with that related to your store. There's, there's other options that are available there to you. It's fair. Um, you know, and I think the other thing I was going to add here too, is that, you know, if, if you are doing something online, if there is any kind of online presence to your store, whether it's, you know, just as simple as being able to make, you know, some purchases, you know, through searching on Google mm -hmm. or whether you're connected to a, you know, a local, you know, delivery service mm -hmm. or whatever it is, just make sure like, you know, and I think this is something important for VARs and ISVs working with these retailers to do is to make sure that there's a, a plan to bridge any gaps between what's happening in store mm -hmm. and those online mm -hmm. platforms. And at the staff, whichever on either side, working either end of it knows what's going on with the other, mm -hmm. because there are times that I've encountered this where, you know, you, know, you go to look for up something online or whatever to purchase it, and you're like, "Yeah, I want to buy that." And it says, "Oh, it's only available in store." Then you go to the store, and they're like, "No, we don't have that." What are you yeah, talking about? It's like, not. Well, this this yeah, says really you do. <laughs> You know, and that's the kind of stuff where, you know, oh, it, it, some, some smart integration, yeah, some, right. some intelligent design behind it and making sure that there's a way to to keep everybody involved and in understanding what's happening on both ends there. I, you know, it, Yeah, mm. but are you painting a Nirvana that's going to take us a while to get to? Probably. I mean, what, what do you think, Richard? Yord? I'm probably I mean, I, I, pie in the sky a little bit about this well, one. I think so. Yord was just arguing that the micro retailer, maybe we're there, right, with with, with the these big POS uh, that, that have revolutionized, you know, the payment uh, type POS right. that Right. revolutionized it maybe i don't know a little bit i don't know yeah your guys take on that a little bit more yeah, I, I mean how, you go ahead rich i was, I was just gonna say oh, oh, literally all i have to say about this is how difficult can it be it's it's not rocket science is it you know it's not rocket science that's true this is <laughs> we true say we might have some folks that might disagree but yeah to your point it shouldn't be that difficult it shouldn't be yeah the technology you know, I mean, is there right it's just the implementation <laughs> the execution Exactly. Yeah. No, I was I was kind of asking the same thing. How difficult can it be? But yeah, personally, I think with the tools around right now, um, you know, building a web shop is not you know what we did in 1999, for example, right? It's totally different today. So if you 
at a Shopify account for 30 euros, you have a, you know, good findable web shop that, you know, you can implement omni-channel. So there are so many tools today around, I would say that, you know, creating an omni-channel is almost, you know, it's mandatory, but it's also not difficult to do anymore. I think as well, if you look at how, how point of sale software itself has changed, if you look at it 10 or 15 years ago, uh, uh, it, it was very much, you know, you had to have a very powerful or the, the most powerful pod system you could get, which by today's standards, it's probably not even that powerful, but um, you, you had to have something so that you could run that locally. Whereas now in, in many cases, even I would even say most cases, to a good extent, the, um, the, the point of sale software that has been used at the checkout has, has gone into the cloud. Therefore, why would it not be linked up to the to the back offices? And, and I think, you know, there's a lot of very good examples of people that we're working with that, that have that have got it nailed i think and, and you know really offering a, a, a good a good service i think there's there's also a bit of a lag and and there's some uh, some software and some retailers that that need to spend money to to catch up as well hmm. yeah. interesting so all right so if your argument is that it's already table stakes to have omni channel experience let's go down a path well then what's next you know where where are the next trends is it is it personalization you know is it the fact that now retailers need to be even more sensitive to who their customers are and try to personalize that experience even more is it a focus in on customer service you know i could mm -hmm. i could argue mm -hmm. that that you know because we've we've dialogued about that oh, yeah. okay so now you have these these people that are working for you how do you pivot them into is it is it more of a brand ambassador or you're you know you're helping them out in store more right, of a right. personalized experience you're not just there to just you know, yeah. check somebody out and take their money and send right. them on their way. Yeah. So the text covered. What do you guys think? Is it is it a move towards personalization? Is it a move towards greater customer service for retailers to to remain successful? I think uh, I think there's a, there's a lot of things involved in it. I mean, part of it is is having the right technology in the hands of the staff so that they can be enabled to to support. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think um, mobility tablets, even down to the micro merchant uh, level. I think you know this is. You know, to a good extent, I think what some of the benefits are of, of, of taking a traditional POS system and turn it into a tablet-based point of sale system is that you can pick it up and you can walk around and you can do that personalized shopping experience for your customers there with with information coming back to you about um, about the, the the product, what's the origin of this product, uh, where where was it made, that that kind of thing. And I think I think technology enables the the retailers and and, and the staff in the retailers to be able to do that to 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 a good extent. Yeah, and also besides the stuff, I think we've taken another level with digital signage, where we, you know, put screens into the store that basically guide you through a different uh, customer service level. I would say, and just to give you an example, uh, we have a project in uh, Dyson. Um, so Dyson basically all the stores for the hair blowers and the, uh, the vacuum cleaners. You walk into a Dyson store, you cannot actually purchase something there. You can put it together on the screen. You can test the unit and you can put it together with different colors and specs. But once you want to buy it, you press the button, you check out on the actual screen in store, you go home and it's the next day it's delivered. So it's not even possible to actually pick something up in that store. So that's even a step further already. Where if you, if you felt how heavy a Dyson cleaner is, you wouldn't want to carry that home with you. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt, yeah. Uh, Unless you got one of those gi our giant yeah, American yeah. trucks, then you can... You well, know, yeah, then you just throw in the back of your pickup truck. <laughs> yeah, th th this technology is unnecessary in America, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, it's fine. You can throw anything there. You can a washer, dryer, for Doesn't refrigerator, matter. sure. Yeah. We Doesn't got matter. room for it, yeah. yeah. But, you know, I think you bring up a great point there, though, because I think that is kind of what may be the next level of the retail experience. Well, I'm kind is, of feeling like Europe's ahead of us on the Omni yeah, channel, but go I, ahead. I, I agree. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Like, I think, because I feel like that's something that we're we're heading toward, mm -hmm. but that we still have some resistance. And I don't know if the resistance mm -hmm. is coming from the retail side, the, the desire to, well, you can't let somebody walk out without something in their hand. Mm -hmm. But again, if you're if you're enabling purchases where you're making this experience where they can build their perfect product and they can design exactly all the features they want, put it all together. I mean, sure, you could have some like you know shop models around or whatever to, you know to mm -hmm. to look at and interact with and touch if you need to you know to get a feel for that. But mm -hmm. let's be honest, we, we there is situations where we still kind of do that. Like you know, I, my wife and I went out furniture shopping mm -hmm. not long ago, right? And you know, you go and you look for something. You're like, well, I like this, but I want a different fabric. I right. want a different color. I want to 
you know, I want it to recline a little bit more, you know, or, or you know, be, you know, motorized or something instead. Yeah. It's, it's likely they don't have the stuff in stock, the exact item that you're wanting. Plus, again, all the pickup trucks in the world can't only get so much move, <laughs> moving That's back right. and forth. That's you know? right. So, like, you may not have the ability to take it home with you right then anyway. You need it delivered to you. So I, that's where I feel like, you know, maybe we're going to start seeing more and more of that kind of experience mm. happening at, you know, at a more granular level, not just the giant items that mm-hmm. you that, mm-hmm. that make it that are difficult to haul around anyway, but mm-hmm. the, yeah. the Dysons can, of the world. You know, I'd love to see more of that. I think it'd be fantastic to have that opportunity. Yeah, you can certainly do that sort of thing. I think... Um, in in ikea is the probably one of the, probably the most famous european shop in retail you can certainly do that that kind of thing there you can go around and or rather you can be you could be dragged around the uh, the ikea um by, by your other half and uh, um kind of forced to buy whatever furniture is is on offer but then you don't you're not then expected to uh, to go out and buy a pickup truck to be able to transport your sofa home with you can uh, you you can shop for it in store and, and you can you can do that and you know why i i think that that won't necessarily be restricted just to just to, to items that are too heavy to, to to walk away from the store with. I think uh, increasingly people will expect to be able to, um, you know, do that even with with something pretty portable like clothing. Be able to say, well, this is what I want, and by the way, I'm staying at this hotel. Can you um, can you have it delivered there by tomorrow morning? And uh, there's yeah, there, there's no difference between you know doing that with a sofa or a pair of trousers, really. And also a, a, a pretty new trend, I would say. We don't have much stores yet in, uh, in Europe, and I don't think in the US either, but it's the urban store concept where you basically put in all different kinds of products. There are only people there, only uh, employees that advise on certain products. So, for example, there can be a Tesla, there can be a, a sport bike, there can be socks, there can be all different things. You can just you know feel the product, see the product, and if you want to buy it, or order it, you just scan the QR code that's on that specific product and it guides you through a web shop. So for example, Amazon. So they get sponsorship from Amazon to promote those products in a store. And that's a total different concept, of course, where you have diff- you can basically have all different kinds of products in the same store just to test out and to see. And once you want to order it, then you buy it online. So the sale goes directly to Amazon. But of course, the urban store gets a fee to display those products in store. And that's a new concept, I think, that will also be very attractive in the, you know, let's say, upcoming 12 months. Yeah. Not heard of one of those yet. I say, you know, that reminds me of, um, have you seen the movie The 40-Year-Old Virgin? Yes. So the, the the woman he dates towards the end of it has the, the eBay store yes. that she opens up where right. you can't buy any of the stuff. You have to go on eBay to buy it. <laughs> that's right. Kind of reminds me of that. And, and I think that's- Dude, that was so 15 years ago. Though. It was, true. But that's one of those things that I feel like would still be a little bit of a hurdle here in the U.S. When somebody would come into a store like that and be like, well, I want to buy that. that. Like, you can't just scan this code and you can go online and buy it, but I want to buy that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like, I, it's, again, I like the idea, but I think it's one of those things that's going to take some time to get folks to actually acclimate sure. to the idea of, hey, you can come here and look at anything you want, but you have to buy Wait, it online. The yeah. delayed satisfaction? Yeah, it's, that, maybe that's what I it is. I don't know, maybe man. It's the you delayed know. gratification. Yeah, there, gratification. Yeah. That's yeah. the word I was looking for, yeah. So, I don't know. yeah. I've got a question um, back for you guys. Um, so um, we... Big big thing for for here is grocery shopping, online delivery of of grocery shopping. So, you know, we we get a delivery once a week from whether it be from Tesco or Sainsbury's or one of the one of the local supermarkets here. So it, it's even I can't even remember the last time I pushed a trolley around the supermarket. It's, it's, it's a couple of years ago. Uh, is that uh, and that's I would say that's relatively common certainly here in in the UK. Would you would you say that's that's also um, a, a pretty common thing in 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 the US too? It's growing. Let's put it that way. And I think I know I was an early adopter for the grocery pickup. Like yes. as soon as like our, yeah. our Kroger is our you know big local yep. regional chain. Like as soon as they introduced grocery pickup, I was all on board with that because I usually do the grocery shopping. Because I was like, hey, I'm all for not having to walk into the store and push the cart around, push the trolley around. I'm fine with not doing that anymore. I'd love that. So I was all on board with that in the pickup. I still do it to this day. Mm-hmm. I very rarely mm-hmm. go in the store to actually, if I do, it's just odds and ends. It's not a full on shopping trip ever. And now you're starting to see the delivery angle starting to pick up a little bit more. I've only done that a, a couple bit. times. Yeah. And I don't know why I'm a little, my wife is even mentioning like, I don't know why you're not doing the delivery more. Yeah, that's interesting. And granted, the Kroger's not far from me. So it's not like I'm, it's a long drive for me to go do yeah. the pickup. Do you still enjoy the experience? I, I kind of do. It? Maybe. Yeah. I don't right. know. Well, Maybe that's it. I, got a little... I mean, because I'm literally just driving up and parking my car yeah. and open the, the trunk and someone's putting stuff <laughs> in. But it's also like 10 minutes where I'm like, hey, I get out of the house uh, for a little bit. I don't know. But, uh, well, but to your point though, yeah, I don't know that we're, 
I don't know that we're as on board with it as we uh, should be because there's you walk know. into a store, you still see a lot of people. In yeah, the yeah, shop. yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's my commentary on that. Uh, we definitely do that as a family. We do that, and I would maybe skew towards families. You know, are are more inclined yeah. to yeah. do specifically here. We're talking about you know picking up groceries. Now, here's the issue. Here's the issue with I guess Omni Channel or whatever this this whole experience. So our experience, and I won't name the large grocery chain that we go to. <laughs> That happens to be based in Cincinnati. Um, but, you know, most of the time they get 95% of whatever we put in right, our cart, right. on our online cart, correct. But there's that 5% yep. that they, the, you know, whatever. They yep. try to try to do a swap. In fact, just last night, Patty and I were talking about this. She ordered red cabbage. They replaced it with green cabbage or something right. like that. And it's right. like, no, there is no replacement for red cabbage for what I'm trying <laughs> they to do. They are two different things. They're yes. to- two totally different things, number one. Number two produce whenever the pickers you know yeah, because a lot yeah. of it still is in store they don't have the scrutiny of you know is that a good strawberry right, batch of strawberries right. or not they just throw in whatever and so we get it home and we literally throw away about five percent of whatever they give us so we're a little disgruntled on the whole you know go, right, right. buy online pick up in store as it relates to that do you but, guys experience that yeah, like you I get mean, the same experience from like a tech are you well, getting kind of just unnamed you named know. large grocery <laughs> <laughs> I've I've certainly I've shopped around between the different um, between the, the different companies. Um, I've got a, a particular personal vendetta against one supermarket. I'm probably not allow, allowed to name because they were they were particularly uh, they were particularly bad. And and also when when I was uh, unless I could demonstrate that what they delivered wasn't you know was you know that the mince had got the mince beef had gone off. Unless I could show them a picture of it, it was like it was like dealing with um, you know. Uh, Inspector Cluso trying to uh, trying to trying to prove that the case of the, the of the off mints, and it's um, you know but but you know we changed and and actually who we're with at the moment is is, is pretty good but uh, yeah I think some do it better than others but certainly it's it's, it's maybe I mean it's maybe perfect. that's just it is you have to just bake in a little there's you have to bake in a, a little bit of all right it may not always live up to hundred percent expectations I don't know and uh, maybe that's the problem I mean, maybe here in America we've, we've we're always been, like you know no damn it's got to be perfect for yeah. literally years now because this has been going on ever since yeah uh, you know COVID hit so yeah, we're three I, years into it and it literally happens every time and Patty has to get out of the car and go in yep. and still do some amount of shopping so it's like and I always ask her well so what what the hell are we doing here why don't we just go back to where we were anyway no uh, I I, you know, I get you I understand I. I I guess the convenience factor still outweighs the. So here's where I'm at. Yeah. If it's dry goods that you really can't mess up, right? You know, then or you don't mind that it's you ordered one form of toilet paper they gave you. Toilet paper right, was right. a different brand, right? Okay, I'll deal with it. You right. know, but but as opposed to you know bad produce or whatnot. Hey, look at this. Yeah. Doing a deep dive on this. That's a really good question. <laughs> it is there, that. I mean, yeah. yeah. But you're right. I think well, there's. But that gets down I, to the I, human element of this whole right. automation that we're that we're talking about the technology, and sometimes it fails. Well, a little bit. and let's be honest. Also, here in the U.S., and maybe this is the case for you too, but it's also a, a haves and haves nots kind of thing too. That no, this is sure. a this is a th- this is a problem that we First have. World problem. That there yeah. are a lot of folks that are like, hey, I can't even, yeah. I don't even have a grocery store that's within yeah. ten miles They're of me to go to, yeah. yeah, to to right now anyway. So you know, let alone someone that's going to bring something to my door, whether it's high quality or not. So I think there's some, there's a lot of work we need to do around that. I think in the U.S. in general. George, looks like he's chomping at the. Go ahead, George. Yeah, I think also we take it a step further in Europe. I don't know. I think you guys have GoPuff as well, uh, but we have a couple companies like Gorilla mm-hmm. and GoPuff that, of course, operate in Europe. Uh, that's a different, you know, service level. They order, or when I order something at Gorilla, for example, right now, I got it in 10 minutes. I, they, they offer it to me within 10 minutes after my ordering, which is, of course, crazy. But this is something that we do, for example, if I need dinner tonight, I will order through Gorilla. So I don't have to wait, you know, of course, with the supermarkets, you have to schedule, you have to order the day. And then, you know, next, or for example, Friday will, will get delivered. Um, and that's the, I think, where, where, where we see in Europe this, this new wave of delivery within 10 minutes from a local dark store. I think what we're also seeing here, Yord, is the impetuousness of youth. Yeah, maybe. maybe and, 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 and back and forward planning on, on your behalf. Yeah, could be, could be. But I think also, you know, for example, when I order uh, uh, from the grocery store, when I, you know, when I need to make dinner and I go to the grocery store right after work, I'll tend to take on like 50 extra items because I'm hungry, right, for tonight, you know, for snacking, whatever. That's something I think, exactly, but if that's, you do that's not the fun of it. 
Yes, but if you're doing online, it doesn't happen that way. So I think supermarkets don't really like the fact of ordering, right? It costs them more. It's more, of course, employees that have to drive instead of them being in the, in the store itself. And they don't upsell as much as they do online. Because let's be fair, if you walk into a grocery store, you've been guided through the things that you need to buy, right? <clears throat> that's not online. Online, you just search for the products that you need most likely for that week. So that's a, that's a big difference, I think, where grocery stores would, you know, they don't really like the fact that they're doing deliveries at the moment. <laughs> yep. yep. I would agree with that hard because yeah. I got kicked off the grocery team because of my discretionary spending. I go, it's 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 known in our family that oh just go with dad to the grocery store right. because you can get the, whatever you the want. Cart will yeah. be full of stuff that was not on right. the list at all. Yeah. I, yeah. Famously got a fuzzy green volleyball. Why? Because we were having fun with it in the aisle and it had to come home, but it it wasn't on the shopping list, all right? So you, anyway. You are a supermarket dream. You're the you are <laughs> oh, yeah. the ideal customer. <laughs> They oh, see Dean walk in like, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh yeah, baby, yeah. we're making our we're making our budget today. <laughs> I, I exclusively shop online, and I've never bought a green volleyball. Ever. <laughs> see, there you go. Right, that's a good yeah. point. Yeah, there you go. All right, well, hey, let's wrap up this conversation by talking a little bit about payments. And this is an area where the U.S. has typically lagged behind the yeah, rest of the for world. Sure. Um, you know, when it came to introduction of mobile payments, I mean, even when they introduced the chips and the mm -hmm, cards, mm -hmm. that was a huge, colossal nightmare for for U.S. the U.S. banking system to get around. Yeah, mobile payments, online payments, all this stuff. It seems like we're the we're the last ones in on a lot of it. And I know Europe tends to be one of the first ones to adopt a lot of this, probably in part because of those financial, you know, uh, you know, challenges between country to country. So, you know, but why do you think that is? Why why do you feel like we're behind? Why has Europe, you know, done so well to embrace payment flexibility versus what we're dealing with? Well, Yord's got a, a much deeper take on this. He's been, he's, he's much more knowledgeable about payments than, than I am. But I think it's probably, probably the biggest thing that I noticed last time. I, I'm lucky enough to come over to the US, uh, was over there for Vartec in, in September and also uh, visited the NRF show in, in January this year. And the, the thing that struck me both times was the, it's specifically when you're in a restaurant and then when you come to pay your, your bill at the end of it, you still have to take out your physical credit card and you have to sign for that. And, um, you know, I, I can't remember the last time I I, I had to sign for anything um, when when paying for for things um, here, and um, you know, I mean, it was it, it's and I don't necessarily think it's a it's a lack of technology because the the same that same contactless payment technology you can pay that way in a U.S. grocery store, for example. So that the technology exists, and uh, um, I was I wondered if it maybe had something to do with the the tipping culture in 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 U.S. restaurants that there's a, there's a uh, that there's a and that's the reason, rather than that, the, the technology isn't there to um, to do that. Um, I mean, you know, it was it was a it was a ballpoint pen that I signed with, not a not a feather quill. So it was <laughs> so, some concession to technology has been made. Not that um, far behind, yeah. <laughs> uh, you're tapping in. Uh, don't get me started on the tipping thing because uh, now everybody, yeah. like every screen, you have to tip. No, yeah. like no. Like, hey, I ordered something that I have to walk into your store and pick up off of a shelf myself. Yeah, I'm not that tipping All you, you did was just throw into a bag for me, uh, and, and I'm supposed to tip you $5 yeah. for that? Yeah. Jord, what are your, your thoughts, yeah. though, on the payment side of things? Well, I think the, 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 the biggest difference between U.S. and Europe is, of course, credit card, debit card. And we are a debit card, I would say, based European uh, country, and the U.S., of course, is very based on, on credit card. Um, that's the biggest difference, I would say. I think on debit cards, there's much more technology that you can implement for the merchant itself uh, than a credit card. And of course, you are bounded by the credit card schemes from Visa and MasterCard, which we're not if we, if we build solutions on debit cards. Um, so I think that's the biggest difference uh, if we talk about payments within, within Europe and the US. Um, and of course, then, you know, we talk about the technology that we have implemented, I would say, in the last 18 months or so, and that's called Softpulse. Uh, Softpulse is a technology that, um, that's that been out there now for quite a while. Uh, last November 2022, it's been approved by PCI. Um, and basically, you know, it's, it's legit now to, to, to roll out. Softpulse basically makes any Android 8.0 or higher uh, with NFC capabilities into a payment uh, uh, system. So, for example, if you have a you know Samsung phone, uh, just a normal consumer phone, if it runs eight or higher, it can actually turn that uh, device into a uh, payment system, um, which of course is incredible. 
because there's many systems out there, and especially for nano and micro merchants, that are stationary on their own equipment. So it's basically bring your own device, they have their iOS device or they have their smartphone, um, and they basically implement the solution on those type of devices. And that's, I think, the biggest difference today in, in, in payments within the US and Europe. That's a big question for us as well, because obviously, um, if it's a if it's a physical payment device that needs, for example, a built-in receipt printer, then obviously that's a that's that's a hardware sale opportunity for us. If you can, uh, you know, if you can use something that you've already got, if you can use your your own mobile phone that you already own to take payments, then you know, where's uh, how are we going to hit our targets? That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Good yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know you know. I, th- I feel like a lot of what happened here is. A, a lack of training, a lack of discipline about some of the technologies. Oh, in the U.S.? Yeah. You're back in art? Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. because, I mean, to Richard, to your point, you know, a lot of the the technology did exist. You know, it wasn't like when we rolled out, you know, the chip payments or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, that was a little bit of a struggle to get folks on board with it. But, mm-hmm. the, like, the terminals were being rolled out pretty quickly. And then we had this weird phase for a while there where they were taping off the part where you'd stick your card in <laughs> and said, no, you got to swipe it still because for some reason <laughs> something they wasn't turned e- right, on yeah, in the yeah, store yeah. or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the mobile payment stuff, I know like, you know, you and I were both pretty early adopters of right. that stuff on yeah. our phones. Yeah. It was mostly just that like the, the terminals would have the option, but you'd go to do it and someone would look at you like, what are you doing? What, like, are, you, what are you trying to give do? Give me your yeah. cash or your yeah. card. I'll go on paying. You're like, I don't think it can do that. I'm like, it's got the little icon right there. I know mm-hmm, it can do it. Mm-hmm. And then either something wasn't turned on or the, the, the cashier just didn't understand how it worked or whatever. So I, I, I guess there was... It, it wasn't so much that the technology wasn't here. It was just it seemed there was a big disconnect between people understanding what it did and yeah, right. talking about it. And there wasn't – and, again, maybe it is because of the whole you – know, although, again, I mean, our payments can use, you know, our credit card. You know, like mm-hmm, all of my, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, mobile payment stuff is tied to my credit card, not That's a debit right. card necessarily. Right. Yeah. So so I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure what this, the, this the big hang-up has been. There's a legislation uh, requirement in, you know, the payment card industry compliance regulation is is, is pretty strict um, over here as well. That's that certainly in the early days was a, was a huge and, and continues to be a, a big driver for for this. I think Softpulse has also developed in, in, in COVID uh, because, of course, the shared of devices. So if you have to, you know, you charge the customer something and then you have to give it to a colleague and the colleague takes it over and charges it to another customer. That's also something why Softpulse has been developed in that region, you know, to have your own phone, to have your own device. You stick with it, you know, all day, you take it home. Uh, that's one of the things I think where Softpulse has accelerated in the last last two years, 18 months um, within, within Europe for sure. Yeah, really interesting absolutely. in the soft pause. Yeah. Yeah. The angle of it. Yeah. Glad you brought We, that. of course, have to find a way to, to still get, you know, our equipment in there. And, you know, we had this, this, this talk at, at kickoff. Um, for us, I really feel that, you know, we don't see a consumer trend going on for the next couple of years, mainly because, you know, if I would work, for example, in hospitality, um, I don't expect my, 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 my employer to give me a smartphone, right, which I drop probably 70 times that day. Right. That's something I think that's still uh, uh, not out there. So we see it in. So, um, I don't. I don't want to be using my twelve hundred pound iPhone to be. You know, to to, the, to the, I could pay, get take money off people for my boss, right? That's. Uh... That sounds a bit strange. So we don't think that that's going to happen. We think still that it's you know payments will get simplified. So the hardware gets definitely gets simplified. So it will be a consumer type of device with a rugged case around it, um, and that we of course can still uh, can still provide. So that's what we think the market will shift to. We have hope because if, if if the whole industry moves to a soft pause, we're just going to go to Canada because the law there <laughs> is that you have to print two receipts, one for the store and one for the patron. So every time there's a transaction, you know, receipt printers are humming, baby. Yeah. Yeah. So Not anyway. very environmentally friendly well, there, huh? Why are you, you going to bring that up? <laughs> <laughs> so there's another hurdle you have to is, jump at some yeah, point. Sustainability. So. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. But I think besides, uh, besides soft pulse, one of the you know larger trends that's up and coming in the last few months is account to account payments and that's something that can only be done on debit um, so it's basically bank to bank transfers um, with this in place there is no credit card scheme involved so it's the cheapest way for a merchant to get involved in payments um, of course you know these credit card schemes are the most annoying thing for a merchant because that's you know a big chunk of their their fee basically um, and with account to account it's a direct debit to the bank so it's a bank to bank so basically an application links to your bank and then it wires it directly uh, within within a very short time uh, period so it's also good for cash flow but it's definitely good for the credit card schemes that are not involved anymore through Visa and MasterCard right? so I think one of the hurdles we would face there what's the security concern there though Jord because now if you have a direct link from my bank account to XYZ you know whatever entity yep. and 
there was some fraudulent activity, you know, with a credit card, I've got that buffer, you know, that yes, everybody's paying the fee, but there's a buffer that if, you know, well, I mean, I get you dispute all the a time. charge or yeah, yeah, you dispute the charge or whatnot, as opposed to it directly yeah. coming out of our account. So is security going to be even that more of a concern then in Europe? So according to the to the statements, account to account payments are more secure than any other payments in store today. And that's, you know, what comes out, of course, about, you know, the, the, the articles that have been written for it. Um, I'm not that technical that I exactly well, know. Until your I, debit card numbers end up on the dark <laughs> web and are bought for like a buck. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I don't know. In all seriousness, I don't know. But that, but that's what prevents me from using right. a debit card right. all the time. You know, there's yeah. so, there are some instances where you have to, like a Costco. Yeah. Uh, if yeah. you go, if you shop there in the U.S., you have to use a debit card or their, or one of their credit card. cards. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. generally, I use a credit card just for that reason yeah. for the for the fraud buffer. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. The banks are, of course, uh, are responsible to do the encryption and the authentication. So everything, of course, is you know the, the banks are responsible for this payment method. Um, yeah, but it's their liability or their responsibility, of course, to make this happen correctly. Got it. There you go. Maybe that's part of our hurdle. You know, yeah. if the banks are being told they have to be responsible for it, they're like, nope, nope. Use your credit card, folks. Yeah. Sorry. I don't know, man. The, you know, I don't think we should give any responsibility today to a bank. <laughs> I think the last uh, the last few yeah, we, weeks have we kind of taught us that. Uh, yeah. yeah. We tried that. Didn't work too well. No, no doubt. Yeah. I guess everybody's bailed out again in the last couple of days. No yeah, doubt. no doubt. All right. Well, hey, we're going to wrap this up in a moment with a little more uh, discussion about trends and predictions yes. from Richard and Yord here. But first. First, yes. uh, as always, we want to thank our sponsors of Absolutely. the Tech Connect podcast, our Tech Connect program in general. We appreciate mm -hmm. all those folks that support our show. Could not do this without you. Uh, hey, if you like the show, we need to hear from you. We always want to hear from you. If you're watching us on YouTube right now, go down below, hit the like button, drop us a comment. We want to see some comments down yep. there. Make sure you're subscribing to Blue Star's YouTube channel so you don't miss this and all the other great video content we're always putting out there. If you're listening on a podcaster that has the option to rate and review, like Apple podcast for instance give us a five-star rating review we want to hear from you we want to know what you think of the show mm -hmm. and make sure you're following blue star on linkedin also uh, if you miss an episode or maybe you're a little behind or maybe there's an episode you just weren't entirely sure was up your alley mm -hmm. or you didn't have time to listen to the whole thing we know we that can happen we can ramble on sometimes absolutely uh, i almost always post a recap of an episode on linkedin right now on the, the the u.s blue star linkedin so make sure you're following us there follow the blue star europe too they're putting all absolutely. kinds of awesome stuff for out sure. there on LinkedIn as well. And finally, uh, if you do want to send us ideas for the show, we want to hear from you. There's always a link in our show notes, whether you're watching on YouTube or your podcaster of choice, where you can submit an idea for a topic to the show. It can be maybe someone else you want to hear from. Maybe like, hey, I love those guys from Europe. I want to hear from them. Oh, I, I got a question them for back you on the show. If sure. You, if I'm in Europe and I make a suggestion, do I still get the free T-shirt? Sure. All right. There you go. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm just speaking <laughs> right. my, from my personal. Oh, no, yeah, we'll send it over. <laughs> okay, I'll say, like, as long as we don't mind Richard the shipping Richard will fee, deliver sure. in person. There you go. <laughs> well, happy to, yeah. Uh, uh, in exchange for a free T-shirt for myself. There, there you go. go. There All there right. So, yes, there you go. You get a free T-shirt just for submitting an idea to us. Even if we don't use it, we will send you a T-shirt. That's right. Just for sending us an idea for the show. So Boom. look for that stuff in the show notes. And as always, if you want to keep in touch with us, you can always find us on Twitter, at TechNechPod, if Twitter's still around by the time you hear this. You know, it seems like every day it's getting close to ending. We'll find another place to go if we have to. You can also email us, techconnect at bluestarinc.com. All right, let's wrap things up here. Let's start with our value to the VAR. This is kind of our way to have a little bit of a takeaway yes. to our VAR audience. Yes. And in this one in particular, I kind of wanted to ask you guys, was there any other trends or predictions, either from the Lightspeed article or some of your own insights, that you think can really help our retail-focused VARs this year? What mm. things should they be paying attention to, looking out for? What should they be getting on board with sooner than later to make themselves successful? Well, for me, I think one of the trends that I'm personally looking at very closely is the crypto space and the blockchain payments, which hopefully will will be implemented somewhere, you know, this year uh, on a, on a good level. Um, I think in this case, the U.S. is actually in front uh, of developing on uh, on wallets and uh, and blockchain technology. Um, we have a couple of companies now in Europe that you know we work closely with to see, of course, what Blue Star's role can be when this actually goes live. Um, so when wallet payments and you know actual crypto payments over the blockchain on you know hardware devices can be managed, um, that's something that I'm really interested in and looking you know following very closely. And for me, I would say um, we we 
the big thing for me at the moment is definitely self-service uh, kiosks and self-checkout. That's 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 huge. I know we, we covered that already. So I'll pick something different that we haven't really spoken about, which would be, it is also linked into what we've been talking about in terms of that stock knowledge, stock availability, um, RFID tagging, particularly in, in retail and most specifically in, in fashion retail. I think that the importance of knowing exactly what stock you've got, what's on hand. And I think that the, adva- the advances in recent years in RFID technology to enable that. I think those that's a really, really key factor, something else, something that's uh, definitely going to continue to grow in the coming years and, and, and have a huge impact on on the that seamlessness between online and in-store. Yeah, I would agree with that trend. You know, and we preach about the RFID mm-hmm. technology mm-hmm. and the need to understand that. And for our customer base, especially you know the the traditional ADC folks, they're used to the barcoding and stuff like that. You got to get to to know the mix uh, and have those capabilities because every time I'm out there, I start hearing more and more use cases on RFID getting trickling down further and further, and further from tier right. one right. all the way down. Uh, so yeah, good stuff there. I'll, I'll throw on the table mobilization. I you know Richard brought it up earlier. I still think that mobilizing from a retail trend perspective, how do you as a reseller you want to make sure that your customers are enabling their associates uh, with technology? And I think mobile is one of those, right? Yeah, but yeah. it takes a rugged ruggedized device uh, to, to to do that. And yep. so uh, having that you know acumen, being able to go in and preach those kinds of solutions, still key. Yeah, I agree. You know, I would say returns management is probably a big deal returns right now. Returns management. That's, you had to go there. We huh? didn't we didn't dive too far into that, but you know, <laughs> I, like that's one of those things that I feel like everyone's still struggling to figure Oof. out like, hey, yeah. how do we have an online presence? How do we yes. have these omni-channel options and manage the idea of returns flowing back in? And we've talked about this on the show before too about the, you know, and I and we and we've got an episode I think coming up about this in the future too about the mm-hmm. idea of of retail space is kind of becoming little mini distribution centers, Mm -hmm. whether it is being able to pull from inventory and ship to other stores or ship to people at their homes, bringing in returns and introducing them back into the inventory and being able to, you know, turn around and resell them quickly or whatever. So I think, you know, any, anything that you can do to help out with that piece of the puzzle, especially if you're working with a retailer that has any kind of online aspect to their particular business, you've got to be having those conversations about, Hey, how are you going to manage returns? How are you going to manage it when someone buys something online and wants to bring it back to you in the store? How are you going to manage when someone is, you know, asking for, you know, buy something at a different store, wants to return it to yours. Maybe inventory has to be shuffled around. Mm. How quickly that does that go back into inventory? So yikes! Yeah, I don't have a solid answer for return management, <laughs> but it's something you should be asking There's about. There's an opportunity and about and talking yeah, about, right? Absolutely. So, uh, I agree with that. Definitely, yeah, definitely yeah. agree with that. Yeah. All right. That's a good one. <clears throat> Right, let's wrap up then with uh, our favorite segment of each week. What's tech yes. connecting with us? This is where we get to talk about something in the world of science, tech, innovation, business, something that yes. caught our eye, got our attention. We just feel like chatting about not necessarily anything to do with retail or any of the rest of our conversation. So we'll let you guys start. start. Your little throw to you first. What's tech connecting with you right now? I uh, wasn't prepared for this question. Maybe you want to go first, Rich, and I will think about it a little bit. I, I can uh, I can pick this one up. I think I think actually uh, it was your crypto uh, crypto uh, thing was your with Tech Connect as well, wasn't it? But uh, um, I for me, I've, um, it's also my favourite part of the uh, the show. Uh, did I mention I'm a regular fan, a regular listener? Uh, yeah, um, but uh, yeah, I think um, I was going to go with. Uh, chat GPT but then I realized that actually quite recently you've, you've had a whole episode on that which was really interesting a couple of other people have picked it so I thought I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to go with chat GPT although it is it is fascinating so what I'm going to what I'm going to pick instead uh, is the humble out of office assistant uh, because that's that's something I, I like to Jordan and I both like to have a little bit of fun with that we we, we try to outdo each other with amusing out of office uh, responses uh, one of my one of my recent ones was um, I'm I'm taking a day off from my favourite hobby, which is replying to emails. What's your favourite hobby? Is it replying to emails too? Uh, followed up by the, when I'm back in, and then it says my favourite thing about being out of the office are all the brilliant emails you receive whilst away, of which yours will the one will be the one I'm most looking forward to reading on my return. In fact, I can hardly wait to get back from my holiday now to open it. <laughs> and so I like to have a little bit of fun like that. Yours had a couple of really good ones uh, too. But then I thought, what if I try to get ChatGPT to write me an amusing out of office response? Because one of the things that I think that AI um, isn't very good at is, is is writing jokes. There was a, there was a couple of experiments they did. Of, um, 
a couple of years back with robots and they tried to get a robot to write a joke and it was with predictably horrible results um so i put i put into chat gpt write me an amusing out of office um uh, response and i got something about that, that actually wasn't entirely unfunny but not really funny enough to read out and then i said I'll, I'll make it a bit more specific because sometimes that helps. And I said, write an amusing out-of-office response in the style of Jerry Seinfeld. Uh, and it goes, uh, hey there, thanks for reaching out. Unfortunately, I am currently out of the office. I won't be checking my emails until I return. Even, and even then, let's be honest, I'll probably forget about this message and it'll get lost in the depths of my inbox. But don't worry, your email won't be lonely. It'll be keeping company with all the other emails I've been avoiding for weeks. You know, the ones that I keep telling myself I'll get to eventually, but somehow never do. Anyway, thanks again for reaching out. If it's urgent, you might, you might want to try reaching me by carrier pigeon or smoke signal or, you know, just wait until I'm back in the office and feeling guilty about all the unanswered emails. Oh, Cheers, there you go. Jerry. Brilliant. All right. Brilliant. I was quite impressed that that's, that's you know, it's not Jerry's finest work, but uh, it's it's not unamusing. And given that it's generated by uh, by AI, I, I thought that was... No, uh, and uh, there uh, lies what we talked about. You got to write the right prompt to uh, get yep. the right answer. But go, yeah, go ahead. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, I can I can think that way. Yeah. You know, I like to do that kind of stuff a little bit too, but I feel like sometimes in the American corporate world, we yes. frown on that kind of stuff yeah, oh, a little too much. Sure. Like, yeah, you're yeah. like, what did you write out of office? Say? Yeah. You know? why, why, yeah. So, why are you putting jokes in there? What are you doing with that? But I appreciate <laughs> that you guys had that sense of humor. I love that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm sorry if I've broken any company rules. No, no, not not even remotely. There's, there's no. It's one of those unwritten rules that doesn't yeah. actually make any right, sense right, whatsoever. Right, right. So. I look forward to discussing this further in my disciplinary podcast. <laughs> exactly. Not the podcast. Yeah. Oh, yeah, shit, yeah. There you go. All right, Yor, did you think of anything? No, I think the crypto uh, stuff that I that I explained to before. I think that's something that you know, especially with what's going on on the banking world today. Um, I think we see an escalation in that pretty quickly. Uh, of course, also in retail and in payments. So you know, that's something really looking forward to and uh, see how we implement it in the in the new world. Definitely, cool. All right, so what's tech connecting with me? I couldn't stop or I could not have this headline. The most loved and hated brands from every country. I thought it was very timely okay, talking about okay. retail and I need some help from our European uh, brethren over there to figure out if this is truly right. Now, I'm already going to contest this though because their methodology methodology was using Twitter as is the benchmark, you know, they they rated, you know, what are the negative responses right, to a brand right. and the positive. So that was the basis. Twitter, of where the entire world is. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And we all know yeah. that, you know, Twitter <laughs> tends, well, at least at the time of this, tended to lean a certain direction. So anyway, it's it, it maybe not has that. But let me throw some at you because I want some takes here. And by the way, so I'm going to give you the most hated brands in UK. I've never heard of any of these, oh, which wow. was kind of surprising. Burberry, Ben Sherman, yeah, Burberry, yeah. Brivik, P PLC, Blackwell, Prezzo, Yo, Sushi, uh, Card Factory, B&Q, Dyson, oh, okay, I've heard of Dyson, yeah. and Green King. Richard, you ever heard of any of those? Burberry, or all it. of them? And Most of them, yeah, yeah. There was, there was one, Brivik, one of... Um, that's, I, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, those are love brands. I'm sorry, those are loved brands. That I, oh yeah, I was going to say that. That's some some unusual choices. If if those are, I, I don't know why anyone would hate Yo Sushi, where you where you get sushi delivered to you on a on a little um, train set toy. <laughs> That sounds amazing. Yeah, right. <laughs> There's nothing that. to talk so awesome. to heck about that. Yeah. Uh, and so in the Netherlands, Yord, it's Royal Flora Holland. Is you ever heard of that brand? Mm, doesn't sound familiar. What no, okay, see, I don't know. Yeah, well, it's, it's supposed to be the most loved brand in the Netherlands right now. Huh. Uh, would be that. So, but I, but I. So here's the. Now I'll go over to the hated brands. Uh, and by the way, here in the U.S., uh, the most loved brands are Coca-Cola. Just a second. <laughs> I'm sure they're near the top, right? Uh, well, yes. Um, let's see here. Hold on. Uh, let me dive in. So in the U.S., actually, it's. Tiffany's is the number one most loved brand. I know. I had the exact same reaction. I mean, I guess if Burberry landed right at the top of the, U the UK list, then I, that kind of makes T sense. Oh, is that retail? Well, yeah. It's like, it's like high in fashion. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Tiffany's is the famous breakfast restaurant, right? Yeah. Doesn't yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> from, I think I've eaten there. From the beloved movie, uh, for sure. For sure. All right, okay, so all right. some of the so, most hated brands. So I guess brands. if you just love some diamonds, sure. Yeah, 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 right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of the most hated brands in the UK, Shell, I've heard of that, Sky, uh -huh. Lloyd's Bank, 
There's the banks making it, right? Dove, Tesco. Tesco's up on the list there. Argos, Barclays, Vodafone, uh, Sainsbury. What's Sainsbury? Yeah. Sainsbury's is a, is a supermarket. So it's one of, the, one of the top four supermarkets, a bit like Tesco. All right. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So that, that rounds out the list there. Here in the uh, U.S.? Yeah, go ahead. It's interesting because um, the, the, what that also is, is is a list of the probably some of the most successful retail brands in in the uk as well so uh, i think that says a lot of, a lot about the british psyche that we hate success <laughs> whereas uh, i think, I think you, you, you celebrate it much more than we than we do and i think uh, i think shell should be on the dutch uh, of most hated companies there, yeah. i think that should be on, that's probably on the yeah. worldwide list let's be honest well too. and so in the u.s it's fox Fox, okay. you know, the okay. Fox Network, Spectrum, uh, okay, Capital yeah. One, there you go. Pfizer, Pfizer is like one of those <laughs> most hated brands. I get that, right? <laughs> uh, well, especially <laughs> coming out of COVID for crying out loud. And then a bunch of banks are on there as well. Hmm. All right, so the last one that I'm going to give you, though, and I need an explanation here. In Switzerland, for whatever reason, one of the most hated brands is Nestle. I need somebody to explain that to me because huh. Nestle is like that warm feeling brand here in the U.S., right? Like is it just because it's a competitor with, you know, maybe Swiss chocolate Swiss or something? Maybe, maybe yeah. that's it. You guys got a take on why Nestle would be a, a hated brand in Switzerland? It's got some it's got some interesting history to it, I think, is uh, I don't know how, how much you'd want. I'm not very well informed about some of its uh, corporate decisions and i certainly wouldn't want to comment on them but uh... i do remember going down a rabbit hole of some nestle because somebody brought that up i think on another podcast i was listening to and they said just go check out some of the stuff nestle's been up to over the years and i kind of looked into it was like oh okay okay i kind of get now it i get it All okay right. well there all it right. is fair enough i'll go down the rabbit hole someday <laughs> <laughs> What's that connecting with you, John? Uh, all right. So, hey, um, some scientists recently uh, found out maybe that uh, the composition of the middle, the center of the Earth, is a little different than we might have expected. Oh. Uh, recent earthquake waves have revealed a 450-mile-wide solid metal ball that forms the Earth's innermost core. Really? So apparently they, they did this harnessing these waves from earthquakes to measure the innermost layer, found that the center is this 450-mile-wide ball of solid iron-nickel alloy. So previously, many researchers believed that Earth had four distinct layers, crust, mantle, liquid outer core, yep. and a solid inner core. Yep. But the past couple of decades, scientists have proposed that the inner core actually consists of two layers, referred to as the inner core and the innermost inner core. <laughs> Leave it to a scientist either, either to come oh, up with a very uncreative name innermost. or some bizarre yeah. Latin right. name yeah. that no one then can pronounce. Yeah. Yeah. So they've published these papers about it and said apparently because of recent, recent earthquake activities have lent themselves to believe that there is an actual solid metal core down there instead. So uh, the age old thing of, you know, can you drill through the center of the earth to get to the other no. side? I'm thinking no. Like, yeah. no, you know, beyond all the reasons you shouldn't be able and couldn't be able to do that, you're just going to run into a big old metal ball that's going to keep you from getting. To that's that crazy. Much What's even more crazy? So, yeah, go ahead. Also, does this um, does this mean that the documentary film Journey to the Center of the Earth is, is not based on, uh, on on actual facts? I think I not. Think so. I think Mr. Vern just you know fed us a bunch of hooey uh, you know years ago and just you know made up some stuff you know like. But here's one of those facts that I, I, I sit there and I think to myself, really, it's taken us this long to have that answer with all True. the technology that we have and the ability to do whatever. Yeah, and we're just now figuring. I mean, I guess out it it's... wasn't like you know critical to life on Earth to figure out what was there, I guess but not. you know, I guess. But not. yes, you know, like. Everywhere. They're drilling deeper and deeper in the search for oil. I guess they're, they're, they're finding more and more things out. Right. That's true. As it goes to show you, too, there's always, like, you know, for as much as we think, you know, w way out in space is we're going to find all these incredible mysteries, there's still mysteries here on Earth to be right explored here. that yeah. we right in our simply backyard. do not understand. That's right. So. That's right. All right. That is What's Tech Connecting with us. Richard Yord, thank you both so much for joining us today. We appreciate having you on the show. Uh, thanks and, for having us. And thanks, thanks, for being, thanks for being fanboys of the show, too. We appreciate that. You know, it's always nice to meet someone that you know, yeah. really enjoys listening Absolutely. to the podcast. So besides no, us really and, good. and Marco, we know Marco loves to listen to us over and over again as he's editing. So <laughs> uh, until next time, folks, please stay connected. Technic Podcast is brought to you by Elo. All right, so we talked about retail today. Yes. Um, and, you know, you need POS in yep. retail. Yep. So when choosing a POS solution, you, you got to choose the leaders in te touch technology. Oh, 100%. Right? You don't want to put in just anything. Yeah, and that's Elo. 
So ELO touch computers are the surest, fastest way to get a POS application started and provide long lasting use with a multitude of options. So for modular configurations, ELO has the ELO Pause and iSeries touch computers, which are available in a variety of sizes, offer flexible mounting and support for easy customization with a variety of ELO Edge Connect accessories to choose from for self-service and point of sale applications. Now, if an all-in-one solution is what your customers need, maybe like what Richard was talking about, yeah. the space saving. Yes, space saving, yes. It'll compact because you don't have a giant because everything's so big in the U.S. You don't have a giant, huge You've got to have these for, little, yeah. Yeah, right. little small yeah. place. Mm -hmm. So if that's what you need, Elo PayPoint has you covered there, offering everything a merchant needs with a fully integrated receipt printer, barcode scanner, cash drawer, and MSR, all in a compact, sleek design. Nadine, we've talked about this before, but I'm so old that when I worked in retail, I had those giant, bulky yes. computers, green screen, green screen monitors, mm, no yes. touch capabilities no, whatsoever. Touch? I had to go to a separate PC to, you know, look up inventory <laughs> and order stuff or whatever. And, yeah. You know, well, at find least you had a PC. Stock. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, And that was also not a touch screen either. Right. So. Uh, so, you know, these youngsters now with all this new technology, they, they, just, they have no idea how, they good, got how good they actually have it. So. 100%. Uh, well, look, if you want to learn more about how ELO can simplify your next POS project, check out the link in the show notes or contact your Blue Star ELO representative. Technic Podcast is also brought to you by Zebra. All right, look, your customers, they don't have time for printer failure. No. No one has time. Nobody's got time for that. Printers should perform flawlessly, almost invisibly. Yes. But when they're down, so are operations, and you're going to be the first person they call. Mm -hmm. That's you, the VAR or mm -hmm. ISV listening right now. Absolutely. Or integrator or whatever you are. Yeah. They're going to they're gonna want you to fix this problem with I'm printers. hoping we got a solution for that. Yeah, you can remove the hassle with Zebra. There you go. So from simplified setup and quality construction to a perfect performance-enhancing print DNA software tool set, Zebra printers are designed to be self-reliant, durable, and endlessly eager to work. Nice. Yeah. Endlessly you, eager. Who doesn't want, I mean, your employees probably aren't eager to work, <laughs> or the retail employees endlessly probably aren't eager? eager to work. Yes, yeah. I love that. Endlessly eager these printers are. Going beyond just hardware, they deliver the autonomy, intelligence, and, unlike other brands, security, that give you peace of mind and a genuine sense of protection. Print with confidence, knowing you have a partner with 50 years of thermal printing innovation. Don't compromise. Get it all with Zebra. Check out the link in the show notes to review their portfolio of desktop, industrial, mobile, RFID, and more printers. 